Will we kill our space dreams? As rocket costs fall, anyone can launch satellites. Now, stars you see might just be satellites. Shooting stars? Likely just space junk. Space junk is now a massive concern. Worse, it can destroy satellites at hypersonic speeds, creating unpredictable deadly debris in orbit. Some fear we'll one day be trapped by debris with the sky forever close to us. At last, methods to clean space junk have been proposed, but are they truly feasible? Biggest junk, whole rockets, Everything non-functional in orbit becomes space junk, including broken satellites and many second-stage rockets like those from the 1960s space race still adrift in space, each as big as a bus. Smaller items include astronauts' lost items and debris from collisions, some as tiny as mosquitoes. But regardless of the source, without proper management and tracking, it's a fatal threat to active equipment. Why is space junk so dangerous? To avoid falling to Earth, orbiting objects move at high speeds, including active satellites and facilities. For example, the ISS in low Earth orbit at 400 kilometers moves at 7 to 8 kilometers per second, 20 times the speed of sound. Space collisions are far worse, with objects from various directions colliding at over 10 kilometers per second. Forget bus-sized debris, even over 1 cm pieces can damage solar panels or glass. Worse, objects less than 10 cm are hard to track due to their size. So how much space junk is above us? According to ESA, there are 6,800 active satellites and over 32,000 trackable debris pieces. But if including untrackable objects, there are likely over 36,000 larger than 10 cm and up to 1 million between 1 cm and 10 cm. Among these, most large debris comes from second-stage rockets left in space, while small debris from explosions and collisions. Serious space debris collisions have occurred. A major collision happened in 2009 between an active Iridium satellite, Iridium-33-700 kilograms, and a defunct Soviet satellite, Cosmos-2251-900 kilograms. At 789 kilometers altitude, the satellites collided at 11.7 km per second, turning into orbiting debris clouds. NASA estimates this collision produced over 2,000 trackable pieces, many re-entered and burned up, but as of February 2023, about 1,000 pieces remain in orbit. Debris has closely passed the ISS within 100 meter. Can we really clear the dangerous space debris? In March 2023, NASA released a study on methods and costs to clean space debris, including lasers to alter debris orbits, physical impacts for orbit change, and capturing debris for recycling in space for fuel or other uses. Different sizes of debris need varied methods and benefits, thus they assessed two strategies. The first targets the largest, most threatening 50 pieces of debris, like whole rockets or defunct satellites. The second prioritizes removing 100,000 small pieces, 1 to 10 centimeters. NASA evaluated the benefits of addressing both, that is, reducing collision losses. How do we remove space debris? For large debris, the main method is re-entry to burn up in the atmosphere. Simply, it burns up upon re-entry. The plan involves using leftover fuel from completed missions to drag other large debris down. Removing the top 50 large debris is estimated to cost $1 billion but benefits after 30 years will exceed costs, proving cost-effective. For small debris, the main method is cost-effective lasers. Lasers alter orbits with minimal energy, directing them into the atmosphere or away. Laser devices can be ground-based or in space, with space-based being more energy efficient but ground-based easier to maintain. Ground setups are easier to manage. This has sparked controversy, as lasers for debris could double as weapons, like attacking satellites during war. If deployed successfully, cleaning 100,000 small pieces could be cost-effective in about 10 years, faster than recouping costs from large debris removal. 
Now, we have the means, but can we truly clean space? How crowded is space now? Reviewing launch data, satellite launches in the past five years have skyrocketed, with only 200 plus satellites launched in 2012, jumping to 2000 plus in 2022. Most are US satellites, largely from SpaceX's Starlink. Falcon 9's success and reusability lower costs, enabling more small-medium satellite launches, including Taiwan's own CubeSats into space like the 2021 Flying Squirrel, Yushan, and the recent Pearl. If all satellites and rockets become space junk and we can't clear them fast enough, we risk the Kessler syndrome, where debris collisions cause a chain reaction leading to more impacts and debris, increasing uncontrollable space junk rapidly until new rockets and satellites can't navigate, blocking our access to space trapped on Earth by our own creations. Addressing both symptoms and causes, can we manage space-bound objects? The Outer Space Treaty was signed at the United Nations in 1967. It sets principles for space activities, focusing on three satellite-related principles. 1. State responsibility. Nations are responsible for their space activities, whether governmental or non-governmental. 2. Jurisdiction and control. Launching states retain control over their space objects in outer space. 3. Registration. States must register space activities with the United Nations and report their status, location, and outcomes as feasible to the United Nations Secretary General. While nations report to the United Nations, each country still manages its own regulations and control. In the US, rocket launches are reported to the FAA and satellite specs to the FCC with launchers responsible for avoiding collisions. The public sector provides tracking data. The FCC sets disposal rules and fines for satellites. Satellites can be directed to re-enter or move to graveyard orbits. Disposal plans are usually required. Last year, Dish Network didn't follow its 2012 satellite plan, moving it from 36,000 kilometers orbit 300 kilometers further out, ran out of fuel mid-move, drifting just 120 kilometers off course, leading to a $150k FCC fine. This first find for space debris is significant for debris control, showing concern for its hazards and the growing cleanup business. Is cleaning space debris truly valuable? As commercial space activities heat up, making debris removal more than talk becomes a crucial issue. If orbital debris decreases, all orbiting satellites benefit. Like current recycling and waste management, we could mandate satellite makers to pay a space debris fee charging more for extra debris during launch. Rates would increase accordingly. Conversely, companies offering cleanup services could earn debris rights for compensation. While direct economic benefits of in-orbit capture and recycling aren't yet significant, future dedicated space processing facilities could serve as a long-term debris management solution. Surprisingly, the first step towards becoming an interplanetary civilization might be forming space cleanup crews. However, getting governments to invest heavily in the space debris recycling industry may take some time. Compared to the direct impacts of global warming, space debris seems less menacing, as large debris impacts can be predicted and avoided, so its immediate effects are less noticeable. But for astronomers needing clear skies, Debris is quite a nuisance. Finally, what do you think is the best way to deal with space debris? A. Charge all space companies a disposal fee to cultivate recycling firms letting capital solve its issues. B. Start with tech development as rockets are recyclable, satellite recycling tech should follow. C. Do nothing, just wait for humanity to trap itself on Earth, ensuring no increase in cosmic waste. That's all for this episode. Remember to subscribe to PanSci Science channel, turn on notifications, join our channel membership, and stay tuned for more exciting science news and topics. See you next time!